uh, particularly in Europe. China's economic and military power presents a, go a growing challenge to the United States. Proliferation efforts are stalled. Iran continues its quest for nuclear weapons. The Middle East peace process is stalled. U.S. armed forces are at a breaking point. I could go on, but I don't, I'm not here to depress you. Um, <laughs> By the time you leave today, you will have an upbeat solution to all of those problems. Um, but each of these problems are serious and real. Um, but as President Kennedy once said, our problems are man-made and therefore can be solved by man. I, of course, add man or woman now. Um, but it really is, all of these problems are solvable. None of them are solvable if the United States is on the wrong side of them. That's the burden and the luxury of being the lone superpower. Here's the problem why we're not as safe as we should be. We've confused great power with absolute power. And when the US pays the price for going it alone, we pay it when the world public opinion turns against us. We pay it when we're not supported in our efforts in Iraq. We pay it when the world pays it when the world turns against us and won't help us crack down on terrorists and proliferators. So world public opinion matters. Um, not because I care whether or not the French like us, um, but I do care whether our diplomacy is effective. Uh, if you look at America's standing in the world today, world public opinion is turning away from us at unprecedented and dangerous rates. Um, recent surveys indicate that 55% of the citizens of the United Kingdom, this is our closest ally, um, and solid majorities in most of the rest of Europe, do not believe that we're fighting the war on terrorism in earnest. Majorities in seven out of eight Muslim countries say that, believe that they, that they consider that the United States may one day be a threat to their country. In Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim country, the U.S. has gone from a 75% approval rating down to a 20% a 20 approval rating in just uh, the, la the first five years of this century. Now, why does all that matter? As I said earlier, this is not a popularity contest. It doesn't really matter if they like us abroad in, in one sense. Um, but in today's 21st century, it actually does matter more than ever before because what people think of us matters if we want them to solve us and uh, join us in solving our problems. We simply cannot defeat terrorists without others' cooperation. We simply cannot keep weapons of mass destruction out of those terrorist hands without others' cooperation. And if the world does not trust us, they are not going to provide that very essential cooperation that we need. So the challenge for the next administration, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, is to have the U.S. be once again a great persuader, not just the great enforcer. And what that means in practical terms is building coalitions to combat supporters of terrorism proliferation. Uh, you're going to have to use sanctions, and of course, you're going to have to use force on occasion. Uh, it means tough but not necessarily heavy-handed diplomacy and American leadership. And it means de dealing with the difficult uh, issues of our day in consultation with our allies, not because it's a nice thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do. And what that means is putting the United States in the forefront of the world's central struggles. And they differ from us. They differ from what we consider to be our number one threats, which to me, and I think most of us in the room, would be the threat of the next terrorist attack having a weapons of mass destruction. Imagine what had happened in New York or D.C. if those planes on September 11th had had chemical or biological, much less nuclear weapons on board. And we know bin Laden is trying to get weapons of mass destruction. But the rest of the world really doesn't care whether bin Laden has nuclear weapons because they're not his target. For the rest of the world, what they want is to achieve the basic tenets of prosperity, freedom from hunger, freedom from uh, debt, AIDS, poverty, environmental degradation, and war. And in the 21st century, those threats that seem so far away actually can come home uh, to roost. It's important to remember that addressing the world's challenges today AIDS, debt, disease, poverty, the list goes on. It's not some global humanitarian mission that some people, uh, as some people would charge. In today's world, we have to look at these threats as a direct challenge to America. Why is that? Well, take if the developing world fails to stem the rise of infectious diseases, um, deadly viruses appear here in America. If new failed states arise in Africa or Asia, they may well become the next haven for the next Al-Qaeda. 
If we fail to secure stability in Iraq and Afghanistan, the terrorists will continue to exploit those lawless zones and perhaps provide a next haven for the next terrorists or transfer weapons of mass destruction across the globe. And we also have to look at our own energy policies. If we don't wean ourselves off of the, uh, the often corrupt and unstable sources of oil that we do today rely on, we will remain shackled by their interest. So only by helping other countries get what they want can America in turn get what it needs. And only a broad approach that addresses the myriad challenges that face us can keep America safe and secure. And achieving that requires what I call the prosperity agenda, which is actually very simple. If you try and take each piece of the puzzle separately, you get really depressed and want to commit Harry Carey and say it's too complicated, can't do it, let's put up our walls and keep America safe at home. That doesn't work. But if you look at the very simple set of what, what should America stand for in the world today, the rest of the pieces fall into, in, into place. Um, if you look at America, its foundation for greatness sets firmly on its set of principle and ideals laid out in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And at its core is, is the American dream, the opportunity for advancement and a chance to make one's life better. The rest of the world wants exactly the same thing. They want that very prosperity too. Now it doesn't mean you have to be rich and the, the, the billionaires that we have in here in America. What it means is you have to be doing well in terms of your peers. So in the book, each chapter starts with a different middle class person. Some of them are a guy in the Congo. He's happy, has a house with a garden, but he's afraid the war is going to overrun his prosperity. Or someone in River City, Michigan, who can't heat his home and he's upset because everybody Everybody else gets to go out for the occasional steak dinner and he and his wife have to sit home and have hot dogs every night. So it's, it's not some grand form of wealth, but just, we argue, uh, the basics. And for the rest of the world to achieve those basics requires American leaderships on the very issues that they, they care about. The right to own a decent home, freedom from hunger, freedom from that threat of war, and a decent life for their future. And the, the best chance to revive American prosperity in the 21st century, in my view, is the promotion of prosperity both here at home and abroad. There's no doubt that the world is hungry for this leadership. If you just look at the 200,000 people that came out last week to hear presidential candidate Barack Obama in that speech before that victory column in Berlin, now, normally presidential candidates stay home. I've worked on four presidential campaigns, and none of our advisors would have let a presidential candidate during an election put a toe outside the, the continental United States. Well, not the continental, Hawaii and Alaska usually get a short visit. Um, but McCain, too, has traveled abroad. He went across Latin America and to Canada. And these, these travels abroad for the first time in a, the heat of a presidential campaign is a testament to the global nature of our challenges. And if you look at Obama's speech in Berlin, it really was the first international speech of a global, of the first global U.S. presidential campaign. Now, the trip clearly served its purpose in demonstrating that this young candidate can play on the global stage. He looked presidential, going through the Middle East, looking shaking hands in all the positions of power in Europe. Um, but the most important message, if you read that speech, is that Obama argues that the U.S. must engage and lead in finding the world's solutions, the solutions to the world challenges, because they are now our problems, too. And it's interesting that he said this in Berlin, because today, Americans' president must be much more than ein Berliner. He has to be a citizen of the world, because these challenges uh, are global today. And that's why Obama called for American leadership in giving hope to those left behind in a globalized world. Now that message was exactly what the Europeans and the rest of the world wanted to hear. It's why you have 200,000 people coming out to hear a potential presidential candidate deliver such a message. But the real question is, is, is America ready for that message? And that is what the debate about this election will be. The polls have not necessarily shown that they do get that. The polls for Obama, in fact, went down while he was overseas. But my argument is Americans must and have to get that message. Only by forging American-led solutions to poverty, AIDS, the food crisis, the problems of the Middle East, can America regain its standing in the world. And only by regaining its standing in the world can we convince others to help us with our challenge of proliferation and terrorism. 